There we go. All right, so I'm, pass, I'm gonna pass around a, um, a figure. It's not quite as important as periodic table, but for those of you who had lab on Monday, you might have uh, wound up trying to use that list of polyatomic ions to do all the nomenclature a lot. Um, I have a slightly easier to read version. This is the list um, that we're going to, I'm gonna have you memorize for your next in-class quiz, which is a week from today. Um, again, flashcards. Don't forget about this one. In a week, another in-person quiz. Um, looking at the scores, either there was either um, a bunch of people forgot how to how to do closed book quizzes, or a bunch of people forgot about the quiz um, because there were kind of two groups. There were the um, did better than eighty percent, and then there were the the average centered around 50% group. Um, so let's try not to do that again on this one. You don't get two drops for your quizzes, right? So let's make sure we do this um, correct. And this will be the last time I have to just say, just plain out memorize this. So if you have lab today, you'll get to practice using this. Otherwise, and until then, it won't make a whole lot of sense. Um, I'm just gonna clear a few stacks and just pass them around, keep one for yourself. And we'll talk about what it is and how it's used as we get there. Um, it might not be, it might be missing one or two of the ones from the lab assignment. So if there's one on the lab assignment that's not on this list, check the background on the lab. This is far from a, a comprehensive list of polyatomic ions. There's mm, probably close to a hundred common polyatomic ions are just the most common. So these are the ones that we're gonna start with. All right. Okay, two questions, one random question and one that's actually applicable to talking about isotopes. Um, how does gravity affect time? Gravity is weird. Gravity doesn't, fit with their other quantum mechanical forces yet. We don't understand how they work together yet. Um, with that in mind, we also have to consider the fact that time is weird. Time is a lot like space um, in that it's, it's a dimension that we use to describe where something is. When is just a, a, temp, a time version of saying where something is. So if you say where something is in three dimensions, you really need to specify four dimensions if you're trying to tell somebody what, um, how to find something. You have to say where it is in X coordinates, Y coordinates, Z coordinates in three dimensions, and then you have to say when it's there, right? If I just say, oh, go to the bus stop over there and catch a bus. Well, if you don't know when the bus is gonna get there, that doesn't really do you any good, right? So time is really another dimension that's just like space, except it's tied to entropy in the disorder of the universe. So it behaves a little bit differently, but mathematically it's very similar to the other three dimensions. And gravity is weird because things that have mass distort space. Um, if you think about, about rolling a ball, if you roll like a, a ping pong ball on a, a really tight sheet, it would go in more or less in a straight line. If you took that same, same ball on the same sheet, but you put a bowling ball over here, when you go to roll that ping pong ball, it's gonna be pulled towards the bowling ball, right? So, and that's, so that's a 2D representation of, of how gravity works, but it applies to three dimensions and even four dimensions as well. If this ping pong ball needed to end up at the same place as this ping pong ball, you would have to add more energy to it. And it would eventually wind up, if you look at, let's say they're both trying to get to this point right here. If you look at the total distance traveled, when there was a really heavy object there, the total distance traveled is longer, even though they started the same spot and ended at the same spot. 
So when, when you have really heavy gravity or really massive objects, you wind up distorting space and time. And that can that results in relativity. Relativity is the idea that when you when you have two things traveling at different speeds relative to each other, time passes differently for those two objects. And it has to do with how massive they are and how fast they're going. The faster you go, it, it doesn't work exactly like this analogy, but it's similar in that the, the faster you go, you have to accelerate more to go out and back to return to that initial position. And that means that time, in order for everything to meet up at the same point later, time has to pass faster for the object that is going slower, which is weird. We're not going to get into the math for that for this class, but um, that's a, a, a fun question, and it's a good teaser for physics. Um, because you do actually get to calculate some of these time dilation effects. Michael? So it's, it's not the gravity itself. It's the fact that when you have more massive objects, you have to move faster around those objects. Um, so if you don't have massive objects, that doesn't really apply. And it, it really only affects things if you actually wind up meeting back up later. So if you got in a spaceship and you traveled at 99% the speed of light off into the distance and you never had any contact with earth again, then you don't really, time doesn't necessarily travel any differently for you. It's the fact that if you consider earth to be a stationary frame of reference and you go out and then have to accelerate backward to come back, that change in direction is, and is part of what causes that time dilation. So it's it's weird the way that it works. It has to do with the way you define your initial frame of reference. Um, but if you're really careful with your positives and negatives, you can actually wind up doing that math. Um, and that's how you can de determine what's moving faster to relative to what else. Because if we call our spaceship our stationary frame of reference and say that the Earth is moving, then that would give us a different answer, right? So it's actually the acceleration that winds up changing things. And so the, the whether or not something is has um, is exposed to massive gravity is actually less important than the fact that you have to go faster um, to get around that massive object. And so that's the, the example that most people have seen or had some experience with is in the movie Interstellar, where they get really close to the, the event horizon of a black hole. It's not so much that they're close to the black hole, it's that to orbit a black hole that close, that planet has to be moving real fast um, because the black hole is so massive. Think about when you put a, one of those coins in one of those parabolic curves, it's got, it's got more kinetic energy as it gets closer to the bottom, right? It's going faster and faster and faster around. The more attracted it is, the closer it gets to the bottom of that curve. Sam? Could you like, example of the ball goes uh, yeah. Yes, you can, you can think about the way if you, if you were golfing and you cut and you get real close and it almost falls in, but it's got too much energy, it doesn't get caught and fall in, it gets affected by the curve, it changes direction, but it's not captured. Um, and that's that's what happens when you, when you um, basically when we do like um, gravity slingshots with satellites and probes, you launch them with a lot of speed around a planet, the planet pulls on them, but it doesn't capture them. And so they wind up going past it and then accelerate and getting um, out of that gravity well as well. So yeah, that's, that's a good analogy too. Did I see Mikel coming? All right. 
And then the second question, what is heavy water? If you've ever heard that expression, heavy water, um, that actually is directly applicable to what we've been talking about with isotopes because heavy water um, is, is water. It's got the same formula as normal water, except that you've replaced one or more of the atoms with a heavier isotope than normal. So it's still H2O, but the hydrogens don't weigh the same as a normal hydrogen. A normal hydrogen, the nucleus is just a single proton. And so it has a mass really close to, to one. But if you have deuterium, deuterium is the, is what the common name for hydrogen two, meaning it's a nucleus, a hydrogen nucleus that's got one proton and one neutron. So it's twice as heavy as normal. It's two atomic mass units instead of just one. So if you make water out of where all of the hydrogen is hydrogen two, it's more dense than normal water. Everything still behaves the same as normal water, except for the fact that the hydrogens are twice as heavy. Um, and you can also do that by replacing oxygen, which is normally oxygen 16, but you, we can actually make oxygen 18. Does that affect its viscosity? Viscosity, maybe. I'd have to look at that one. It's going to affect the density because all the atoms and the molecules are going to be just as close together, but they're going to weigh more. And viscosity starts to take into account the momentum of the molecules and the momentum of the molecules should be, the momentum of the molecules will be higher, but the kinetic energy will be the same if it's at the same temperature. So I don't know about viscosity specifically. Definitely density. Um, and it makes it better as a um, uh, as a shielding material when it comes because it's more dense. You can use it to protect or to surround a nuclear reactor, and it's going to let less radiation um, escape. Because being more dense means you've got more mass and more nuclei um, that can actually capture that harmful radiation before it makes it through. So you see, um, heavy water gets used in a lot of nuclear applications because it's a better shielding material. Um, and also, um, in theory, if we ever get fusion working, um, fusion reactors would be able to use hydrogen two, which is about 1%, or is it 1% or 0.1? 0.1% of all hydrogen atoms in, in our solar system are deuterium. And you can force deuterium to go through a fusion reaction and then and it becomes helium and releases a whole bunch of energy. So hydrogen too, being as plentiful as it is, 0.1% doesn't sound like that much, but there's a lot of hydrogen on Earth. So in theory, there, we'd have an endless source of energy of electricity if we could get fusion working based around using hydrogen too, um, just because it's, uh, it, there's a lot of hydrogen around. It's not nearly as rare as say something like uranium. All right, recap of where we ended with isotopes. We started talking about weighted averages. And we were talking about weighted averages in the context of, um, if we want to know what the average molecular or atomic mass is for a sample of atoms, we just need to know how heavy each isotope present is and how abundant it is. And so you can think of this percent abundance or natural abundance a couple different ways. You can think of it in a probability sense in terms of, okay, if I picked an atom at random, what's, what's the probability that I grabbed a hydrogen two, for example, versus a hydrogen one? Um, you could also think of it as saying, okay, well, 99.9% .9 of all hydrogen is hydrogen one and 0.1% of all hydrogen is hydrogen two. So it's, it's just a way of looking at how common the different isotopes are um, in a certain system. And so us being Earth-centric, we're going to predominantly be using the, the atomic masses that are on the periodic table that are for the natural abundances on Earth. Different solar systems, even different planets within our solar system might have different natural abundances because the processes that formed our planets are going to be going to allow certain isotopes to be more common in some places versus others.
just ba based on the mass and the way that the planets all came together. So our natural abundances are specific to Earth, um, and that also applies to um, that question. That I removed the extra slide. Now, where's the? Yeah, I do want that one. Um, the periodic table has just for some of the masses just has their masses in brackets or in parentheses in this case if you looked at, at technetium for instance that just means because it's a synthetic element there is no natural abundance on earth this element is not found on earth naturally so we have to pick something to put for the mass number so they just pick the most stable isotope um, that we're aware of and they just put that in parentheses to indicate that that's not a naturally occurring mass number but um, that's the most common form of that particular element. Right? And so you mostly see that with the, well, you only see that on the periodic table with the synthetic elements. And most of the synthetic elements are down in row seven um, the, in the lanthanide actinide sequence down at the bottom here. Um, basically, the only one of these that's naturally occurring, uranium is the highest naturally occurring uh, atomic number. Everything larger than uranium is synthetic. All right, so what does that mean for, for um, doing some math with these? It just means that, you know, this is the compact, complicated looking, I guess the mathematicians version of how to write this as a formula but all it is is basically you take your percent abundances and you multiply the mass of that isotope and then you just add all the pieces together right so just to remind you how how pers or uh, weighted averages work for grading let's say let's take this class that has what do we have four categories in this class? Three assignments, quizzes, and the final exam, I think, right? So if we have assignments, and that's what, 30%? 40%? I think, I think that 35. We'll just, it doesn't matter what this class actually is. We're doing this as just as an example. So assignments, quizzes, we'll call that also 30 35%, and exam, we'll call that, so that is the remainder, which is 30%. If that's the way that they're weighted, you can think of that as being like the percent abundance. The percent abundance is, is that, that probability for each, or how important each particular isotope is. And then the score that you get in each category is like the mass. So let's say that somebody got, I don't know, a 92% here. And on quizzes got an 83%. And on the exam, 81%. What's the final grade? Well, it's the weighted average of all three of these scores. You're going to take 35 as a decimal and multiply it by 92. 0.35 times 83. 0.3 times 81. And just add those numbers all up. The final grade, the weighted average, is just the sum of the weight times the value. So that's the exact same thing that we do for the, for the um, atomic masses. So let's do a practice. Let's say that we have two different sources of lithium. We have lithium from naturally occurring materials that has that is 75 or 7.5 percent lithium six and 92.5 lithium seven, and we have these two. Sorry, don't mean to cross that out, but and we have masses of 6.0. Etc. AMU and seven, etc. AMU. 
However, there's another source of lithium that is where it's, this would be an example of an enriched sample. When you hear about enriching uranium, what they're really doing is they're concentrating some isotopes so that your sample doesn't have the same ratio of isotopes that it would, would if it was found in nature. So in this case, we have an enriched sample of lithium um, where we have extra lithium seven and not as much lithium six. The average atomic mass of these two samples is gonna be different because they don't have the same percent abundances. So let's calculate the atomic mass for both of these samples as practice here. And so to, to write out that formula, you'd say, okay, the atomic mass for the first sample for the naturally occurring is gonna be mole fraction or the, the abundance of lithium six times the mass of lithium six plus the abundance of lithium seven times the mass of lithium seven. If there's only two isotopes present, that's as complicated as it gets. If there are three isotopes present, you'll have a third piece. And so it, you just extend that. That's why it's written with that sigma notation is because you can have a whole bunch of isotopes present. And you just make this have as many terms as you need. So for our naturally occurring sample, we'd have lithium six is 7.5%. So divide that by a hundred to get 0 0.075 is our, as our abundance. And the mass for that one was 6.01512 AMU. Then we take the remainder 0.925 times 7.01600 AMU. So what do we get when we plug that in? Six point six point nine something nine four. Oh, and I have a typo in there, right? I missed a three. No, that was for the second source. Never mind. I did have it right. We only get to keep two sig figs though, right? Because these percentages are measured numbers. So we only get two sig figs, so it would just be 6.9, unless we were really careful with measuring those, those percent abundances. If we're looking at the second source, the masses don't change, right? It's still lithium six and lithium seven. So the masses are the same. The only thing that's changing are the weights, the, the abundances. And right, so in that case, didn't need to do that. So now it's 0 0.0375. And how do we know what to put for the abundance for lithium seven? And, and what does that give us? How do we know what number to plug in? What do we know about percentages? This total has to equal 100%, right? Or in, in fractions, these, prop, these weights have to add up to one, right? So if you're not given, a percentage for the other one, so one minus 0 0.03 has to be the, the amount that we have for lithium seven. So one's up being 
9625. You'd be surprised at how often that writing that out as a um, the, as a algebra equation winds up being helpful in chemistry. Just the simple act of saying, well, I know that the pieces have to add up to the total is actually a really valuable tool in the sciences because if you know there's only two pieces and you know they have to add up to one, then that actually tells you a lot about the system. So what do we get for our atomic mass now? Should be closer to seven even, 6. Point. We get to keep three sig figs now because we were close, we were more careful with uh, measuring the percent abundance, right? So we went from 6.94 to 6.97. So that's not a particularly large difference, but it, can, it just illustrates that all that really changes is, is if you know these masses and you know the weights, that's all there is to it. One more point about weighted averages. If I go back to this equation real quick. That's actually the formula for every average. The average that you're used to, to doing, what do you, how do you usually calculate the average of three points? Let's say we're averaging out 14.5, um, 15.5, and 13.0. How do you find the average? Add by and divide by three, right? What you're actually doing is you're multiplying each of those numbers by the percent abundance. The percent abundance in this case is just one out of three. Each one of those numbers makes up a third of the total, right? So it's really one third times 14.5 plus one third times 15.7 plus one third times 13.0. So weighted averages are just the same as normal averages. You're just used to thinking of everything as having the same weight. If everything has the same weight, then you have the same number in front of each of these. And you can just do a little bit of algebra and rearrange it to make it say, well, just add them and divide by three. But it's really this formula, the weight times the value, and then add up the pieces. Also how you do things like expected value when it comes to, to gambling. If you have this probability of each outcome and they pay out at this amount and or you lose money at this amount, you take the probability of each outcome times the amount that you gain or lose for each outcome, and you just add them up. If you do that for casino games, you always wind up with a negative number because the house always wins, right? It's why it's, you know, blackjack is closest to being even, but it still favors the house by like 0.3% or something like that. Combinatorial math is fun, probabilities and stuff. It's really powerful if you know what you're doing. All right. So let's talk about charges. We've talked about this a little bit. Um, and we talked about the octet rule. Did we, or was that just in lab? I'm getting mixed up. Did we talk about that in lab on Monday or did we do that in lecture? little bit in here all right so yeah the, the rule yes we definitely did that the general rule is we're trying to get to a full octet but that's not always the case right because for metals they can sometimes loot they're going to lose electrons which means you're, you're going to change your number of valence or your valence level um, in order to do that and where this really becomes useful is the fact that compounds that we find in nature don't have a net charge. When you find something stable in nature, um, the charges always have to add up to zero. 
then it's part of the, the nature of matter is that in general, you have a matching amount of protons and electrons. And so you never wind up with extra electrons in a system because they'll tend to find a positive charge and stick to it. So that means that we usually find anything that's an ion, we find it in terms of an ionic compound, right? And an ionic compound just means that you've got something with a positive charge that's attracted to something with a negative charge. And so the easiest way to recognize those is if you have one, if you see that you have one metal and one non-metal in the same compound, that's almost always an ionic compound. In fact, for the sake of this class, we'll say it is always an ionic compound. When you get into organometallics and biochemistry, that's not always the case, but we'll ignore that for now. So if we know what the metal, what the metal and the non-metal are and what their stable charges are, we can figure out how to combine them in a way that their charges add up to zero. So if we wanna know what the compound is that we form when calcium and oxygen mix, we just need to know what the charges are on those two ions. And then we're just gonna say, okay, we're gonna write the formula as um, however many calciums and however many oxygens it takes for, the, for them to add up to zero, for the charges to add up to zero. So what's the charge on a stable calcium? Anybody have their periodic table? It's going to be plus two, right? It's in the second column of the periodic table as two valence electrons. So it's when it's an ion, it will always be plus two. And oxygen's over here in column 16. So its most stable charge is going to be minus two. So if those are our two ions, what ratio do we need to mix them together to get the charges to add up to zero? It's just going to be a one-to-one -one ratio, right? We need one calcium for every one oxygen in order to make the charges add up to zero. So this is our formula. Our formula for this is where you're using, representing how many of each atom you have using the, the atomic symbols, not the names. This is not the name of the compound. This is the formula of the compound. If we wanna know how much this, this uh, compound weighs, well, we know what, what a calcium weight atom weighs either individually or as moles, right? Just based on the periodic table, right? Periodic table has atomic mass for calcium, right? And sure, it lost electrons, but those electrons weigh about uh, 0. 0.0005 ish atomic mass units. They're about 2,000 times smaller. No, I missed a zero. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.0005 AMU. So within sig figs, we can effectively say that well, losing the electrons doesn't change the mass because the electrons are just so light. Plus, if the charges are always going to add up to zero, well, if the calcium lost two electrons, where did those two electrons go? To the oxygen. The oxygen has two extra electrons, right? So as long as all of our charges are adding up to zero, we don't need to worry about the fact that losing electrons changes the mass, because it doesn't really. So if we want to know what the, what the molecular weight is, or the molecular mass, Well, if you want to know, if I told, told you that, um, let's see, what's a good, a good analogy? Um, we'll use a baseball bag. If I told you that uh, a baseball bag has a baseball bat, a baseball glove, and a pair of cleats in it, how much does it weigh? You just need to know how much each of the pieces weighs, right? You need to know what the bat weighs. You need to know what the glove weighs. You need to know what the cleats weigh. If we have this formula that says, okay, for this to be a stable compound, we need one oxygen for every one calcium. The mass 
of this entire compound is equal to the mass of the pieces. And since we know what the mass of calcium is and we know what the mass of oxygen is, as long as we have a periodic table, the weight for this entire compound is just going to be the mass of calcium plus the mass of oxygen. So calcium is right around 40, 40.0 something. And oxygen is 15.999, or 40.08. Actually, keep it the same number of sig figs. I'll carry that extra one. 40.078. Finding the molecular weight is that easy. And just remember that these units are in grams per mole. And when we add units don't change, right? So if we had a mole of calcium oxide, we have a mass for that now too. Let's look at potassium and sulfur. What's the stable charge formed by potassium and sulfur, respectively? What does potassium form? It's in column one, so it, it's going to be a plus one charge. Sulfur is right underneath oxygen, which means it should form a minus two. So we'll get potassium with a plus one, sulfide with a minus two. So to make the charges add up to zero, what do we need? Two potassiums for every one sulfur. And the molecular weight for that is gonna be what? Or how do we need 39.09 I clicked on the wrong thing once I got there we go so potassium 39.098 and there's two of them for every mole of this compound right sulfur is 32.06 and there's one of them for every mole of this compound, one mole of sulfur for every mole of this compound. So 39.098 times two plus, what did I say, 32? And you can write AMU or grams per mole. We're going to use it as a conversion usually in grams per mole. But for the sake of just showing units here, you can write AMU and it's just as, as correct. So our total molecular weight now is just the sum of the pieces. So 78 plus 32, so 110. Point oh, point one, point three, point three. Yeah. All right. So the None of that's particularly hard now that we know how to find the charges, right? And now that we know that what the atomic number means or the atomic mass. Since they never exist as independent in ions, you're usually going to find them as ionic compounds. We need a way to name these. Um, so this is actually out of order. Um, keep going here. Yeah. 
And so that subscript that we put at the end, remember bottom and to the right is how many you have of that particular element. So in the formula, this is how you can represent how many of each atom you need to make the charges add up to zero so that you don't have to write it out as three sodiums with a plus charge and one nitride with a minus three charge. That's a visual way of showing that you need the charges to cancel out. So you need three sodiums and one nitride, but that's not very compact, right? That takes up a lot of space. So this is really just our more efficient way of representing that, right? Because once you know how to use the periodic table, everybody knows what the charge on sodium the ion is. And everybody knows what the charge on nitride is always going to be. And so we don't need to specify the charge every time as long as its charge never changes. All right, so when we're naming these, so again, these are the formulas. If we wanna know the names of the compounds, because it's not always convenient to, to say the formula out loud, sometimes that can be more confusing than helpful. So we need a way to name these as well. And the key with chemistry names is making sure there's no confusion, which sounds, if you were in lab on Monday, that's not how it feels, right? Um, it can be very confusing until you learn the rules. But once you learn the rules, there is no way somebody could hear the name and get the wrong formula, right? So they have to be unambiguous so that there's no possible way somebody could get the wrong formula or the wrong compound from your name. So to indicate something has a negative charge, we change the ending of it. So anion, remember anion stands for a negative ion. It doesn't really, but that's our way of remembering it. Negative ions, you just change the last syllable of their element name to be I. So chlorine, when it has a negative charge, isn't chlorine anymore, it's chloride. Sulfur, when it has a negative charge, becomes sulfide. There's a few of them where you don't just drop the last syllable. So you can think of them as being irregulars. Like when you're learning a language to say, oh, well, this verb gets conjugated. It's an irregular. Um, there are a few irregulars in the way we change these names. And usually you probably already know these because if you didn't change it to be the irregular, it would sound really weird. Like if I said oxygide, it just doesn't sound like, like the, the right way to refer to something, right? If I say iron oxygide, no, don't you mean iron oxide? Yeah, I do mean iron oxide. And same for um, phosphorus and sulfur are the other two commons. Um, nit sorry, nitrogen as well. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. I guess sulfur is not an irregular. So nitrogen becomes nitride, phosphorus becomes phosphide. Sulfur is irregular when we get into the acids, that's why. So if we wanna name these compounds, all we do is we say the name of both ions and we don't change the name of a positive ion at all. Metal ions, you just, just say the same element name. So RBI, rubidium iodide, you change the I, the I becomes, instead of being iodine, it's iodide, and rubidium just stays the way it is, rubidium iodide. Barium and selenium, barium and selenium becomes selenide, which sounds weird, that's the correct way of pronouncing it. The one that really get, throws people off is, let's see, I'll do, so Na plus, so sodium, right? What is Te? Tellurium, which becomes 
Telluride, like the town. I have no idea why the town of Telluride is named Telluride. Tellurium was around first, um, but it is. It's named Telluride. So the name of this compound is sodium telluride, not capitalized. Tell it's a U. Tell you ride. Um, if I had to guess, I'd say that there was a mineral deposit there that they used originally before it was a ski town. Um, either that or there are several towns in the Midwest that are named after just random minerals. Um, so it's likely something like that. When you're looking at the names for why certain towns got named certain things in the US, there's not always a rational explanation. Why do we have an Athens, Georgia? We already had an Athens. Why do we need another Athens? But don't bother putting new in front of it. We're just going to call it Athens. So we're going to confuse people. Um, there's a whole bunch of, like, there's Cairo, Kansas. Anyway. Um, do we need to change anything about the naming if there's more than one of these compounds, one of these ions? Is there any other way you could combine them that makes the charges count cancel out? I mean, yeah, you could have two to four instead of one to two. But if you say magnesium bromide, magnesium is always the same charge. Bromide is always the same charge. So we don't need to specify how many of each of them we have. The fact that we know what the ion is tells us how many we need. If you just say magnesium bromide, somebody says, oh, well, magnesium is a plus two, bromine is a minus one. Therefore, I need, a, I need the formula of MgBr2. Right, so we don't need to specify magnesium dibromide. Don't do that. We're going to get to using those prefixes soon enough. It's just magnesium bromide. All right. Some of the transition metals, actually pretty much all of the transition metals, by which I mean everything from here to the only change color. Everything to the right of this line is a non-metal. Everything to the left of that line is a metal. The only metals that have consistent charges are the first two columns and these six right here. The rest of them are weird in that they can have more, more than one stable ion. They're not all the same level of stability, but it's not uncommon to find iron with a plus two or with a plus three. So with that in mind, we actually need to, we do need to specify something when we're talking about these transition metals. And it still goes to our same general rule for ionic compounds. You just say the name of each ion. We just are gonna specify which ion we're talking about. If we have iron, with a plus three charge, that's an iron ion, but we want to specify that it's iron with a three plus, so we call it iron three ion versus an iron two ion. And so we just have to get specific with our name. That's the only trick to it. And other than that, it follows our same rules. You just say the name of the positive ion, say the name of the negative ion. So for instance, copper can be plus one or plus two, iron can be plus two or plus three. There's the old school way of naming these that we're not going to use at all that uses, um, that uses a different suffix on these to, to determine what the charge is, but that still relies on you having to memorize what are the possible charges. For instance, a cupric ion is copper with a plus two versus a cuprous ion 
is copper with a plus one, that's way more confusing because you still have to know what those two possibilities are, right? So we're just going to not use this form. If you see anything that says ferric chloride, don't worry about it. We're not using that name. We're going to use this style of naming. So over for iron, it would be, let's see, the plus three is ferric ion versus ferrous ion. Don't do the ones written in, in orange. Use this. And I've, I said this in lab on Monday, I'm not going to be that picky about you, whether or not you use um, Roman numerals or regular numerals, um, Arabic numerals, I mean. The, as long as it's in parentheses, you just need to make sure you, it doesn't get misinterpreted as being the isotope. Because if, if we say, iron 58 that's talking about iron hyphen 58 that's talking about an isotope if we say iron 3 in parentheses we're talking about um, the charge on that ion for the most part this isn't going to be an issue because we're not going to be talking about isotopes and charges at the same time very rarely is that going to be an issue, but that's why we differentiate between between them by having the parentheses. If it's written in parentheses, it means we're talking about a charge. And I'd rather you write it in Arabic numerals if you're not sure of how to do the Roman numeral properly. If, for instance, it gets confusing, especially if you're in, in a timed testing environment and you're stressed out. It gets really easy to mix up four and six when it comes to writing Roman numerals, right? Um, in cases like that, if you're unsure, write the Arabic numeral, the standard way of writing that number. Um, just make sure you put it in the parentheses. Key point, when you're saying the name, the number is referring not to how many you have, but to what the charge is. I'm belaboring this point because as soon as we start mixing up formulas and end names, it's really hard to, to say this properly. So for instance, if I say iron three, if the name of the compound is iron three oxide, what's the formula for iron three oxide? How many of each ion, first off, write out the ions and then figure out how many of each ion you need to make the charges add up to zero. Oxide still minus two, iron three is plus three. So how many of each one do we need? Two irons and three oxides would add up to zero, right? So it's like finding your lowest common multiple, right? You want the lowest way that you can make the charges add up to zero. So that means our formula would be Fe2O3. The name is iron three oxide. You see how it'd be really easy to mix those numbers up, right? Fe2O3 is the formula. Iron three oxide is the name. Never use the element symbols in the name. If you say Fe instead of saying iron, that means you're talking about the formula. If you say iron, that means you're using the name. That's the way we're going to keep these straight. So the three does not mean that you have three irons. Fe2O3, when you say the symbols, that's when you're talking about how many atoms you have. Matt? So like with the iron and three oxides, yeah. if you're looking at the formula version of it, would you have to kind of discern for yourself whether it's a plus two or plus three given what the other elements? That's exactly what you have to do. So basically, if you need to know what the charge is on at least one of these to figure out what the charge on the other one is, right? 
Luckily, oxide is always the same charge. So as long as you know oxide is always minus two, from the formula, you can get to the charges of those ions because if it takes three oxides and each oxide is minus two, that allows us to figure out what the charge is on the iron. So let's do one where we practice going that way. We'll do, yeah, we'll do uh, copper, let's see, Cu2S. If we have Cu2S, How do we know, if we want to name this, we need to know what the charge on the copper ion is. So to figure out what the charge on the copper ion is, we need to know what the charge on the sulfide is. Luckily, we always have our periodic table with us, right? So sulfur, when it's a negative charge, has to have what charge? It has to be a negative two. So if sulfur is a negative two, what's the charge on the copper? Each of them is a plus one, and there's two of them. So each copper is plus one, and there's two of them. So two plus ones adds up to one, negative two. So what's the name of this compound then? Copper one sulfide. The formula is Cu2S. I'm going to keep being really, really distinct as much as I can to really drive home because inevitably on the final exam, somebody is going to mix up that number for the, the number that you have in the formula. It happens every year, no matter how much I stress this. The name, in the name, the, form, the number is how is the charge on that pile. In the formula, the number is how many you have. All right. If it's, if we always know what the charge of the ion is, if the charge of the ion never changes because it's in our first two columns or it's in this block of six right here. We don't need to use those Roman numerals. Sodium ion is always the same charge. Magnesium ion is always the same charge. And these three, or these six, I think in groups of three, because there are three columns, always have the same charge. And let's walk through the, the logic of why that is. For this com column for the aluminum, gallium, and indium, how many valence electrons does aluminum have? It's got three electrons. And there's no d orbital. The reason that these ones all get weird is because d orbitals have more than one stable way you can arrange electrons sometimes. But once you have a full d orbital or no d orbital, things behave very predictably the way we've been practicing. So with that in mind, if aluminum doesn't have a d orbital, it only has three valence electrons, what charge would we expect to be stable on aluminum? Plus three. And same for gallium and indium. They have a d orbital, but it's totally filled. And once it's totally filled, you're never going to break up that orbital. So all three of those, aluminum, gallium, and indium, are always going to be plus three when they're charged. If we use that same logic, what can we expect from zinc and cadmium? Exactly. They have full d orbitals as well, right? But only two valence electrons. So zinc and cadmium, when their ions always become plus two. This bottom row, the reason that this bottom row gets weird is because it doesn't follow those same rules because of the F orbital gets involved and because these orbital energies start getting so close together. 
when you get to the higher energy levels, they don't behave predictably. Those energy levels shift just a little bit every time you gain or lose an electron. And that means that there's more than one stable state for them too. Silver is the last one. And that's the only real exception here. The silver one, and sorry, that's, that arrow is supposed to be pointing at the silver, not gold. Silver is irregular because it can steal one of its valence electrons and use it to fill up the, the 4D orbital. And so it only really has one valence electron, even though our normal electron configurations, we'd say it has two valence electrons. Because it's so close to having that full B orbital, it behaves as though it only has one valence electron. So silver will only ever make a plus one. And for those of you who heard that once in lab on Monday, it should make a lot more sense now, right? Hearing it twice makes a difference. And really cement it in your head um, that these six still follow regular rules. It just means we don't need to mess with this. So basically every metal, except for these six and the first two columns, you use those parentheses. So Cu2O is copper one oxide. FeCl3 is iron three chloride. And I'll say it one more time before we take our break. Iron three chloride, the three is not referring to how many of something you have. The three in the name is referring to the charge. I know. Everybody is saying right now, I, we get it. You could stop repeating that. Um, but there's, there's nothing that bothers me more than having to take away points on something that I repeated a whole bunch of times. I really would like everybody to get 100% on that part on the test. <sighs> but that's not going to happen. <laughs> All right, let's take a break. Let's come back at, uh, at what is that, 217 or so. And we'll keep talking about covalent compounds. Questions on the lab. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just wasn't sure if I could explain this for us. So this is Almost. Tin's not one of those six, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So then it has to have a Right. So what's the charge on the tin? There's two sulfurs though. And oh, each so one is negative two. Ten four. Ten four sulfide, yeah. Um, and then I just have four other ones. Yeah. Um, H3, for H3P, so I wasn't sure. Isn't that supposed to be an acid, right? The way it's written, yes. But it's like not. When it's a gas, the fact that it says aqueous is a key that they're really telling us. And the fact that you led with the hydrogen is what's telling us we're supposed to name it like an acid. Yeah. Um, if it was pH3 and it was a gas, we would name it as phosphorus trihydride or trihydrogen phosphate, trihydrogen phosphate, um, which is the way we name it. But because it's dissolved in, in water, that's just telling you to name it like an acid like you did. So then what I, I was calling, well, then this is wrong. But what would you call it then? Um, that's what I'm tri, trihydrogen. So it would be hydrophosphoric acid. Hydrophosphoric acid. Because phosphide, and you, in, and remember, with all the acids, it's all about the ending of the anion's name, right? So if it ends in, if it's phosphide, then you drop hyde and you do the hydro and the it, right? So it becomes hydrophosphoric acid. And then this is sodium hydride, right? Correct. And then 
ammonium nitrate. Uh, yeah, ammonium nitrate. Very good. Okay. And then I just have a few more. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how to name or what the. I wasn't sure what bisulfate was. So, where is. Look, we'll grab at that uh, list real quick. So, I don't. The old school the way of naming them would be for everything, bi just means add a hydrogen to it. Oh. So, like bicarbonate is hydrogen, the same as hydrogen carbonate, but it's more confusing. So, I just have it written this way, but it saves you a lot of space if you know that. If the okay. I just means add a height. So, it's hydrogen sulfate. Okay, that actually helps me. So, it. So, okay, that's bi's hydrogen. And then for strontium hydrogen phosphide, mm -hmm. I put SRHGO3. Is that correct? Is that so phosphite would be a negative three charge. So hydrogen phosphite is one hydrogen added to it. So it would be a negative two charge now. And strontium is a plus two charge. So yeah. Okay. And then acidic acid, I put H. C2H3O2. Bingo. Okay. And then sodium dichromate. And I don't know if I was doing that one correct. I think. So let me, let me double check. Yeah, dichromate. Dichromate is its own polyatomic ion. It doesn't mean that you have two chromates. Dichromate okay. is two chromiums with a bunch of oxygens. So it's Cr2O7. That whole thing with the negative two charge is dichromate. So Cr2. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. So can I just turn? We might want to kind of repeat all these things again, and you're going to wind up coming into a weird circumstance. Like I don't know what it means by that. Um, so it'd be good to at least get some of it done, um, since you already have at that time carved out and left. But you know, but you don't have me either. Yeah. So because of that. So this one is going to be ionic. This one is covalent because the covalent one has one of these protonic ions, but the, this one does not. It's just a part of the oxygen, right? So when we when we're talking about the classification, mm -hmm. there are covalent bonds in the polyatomic ion, but we still consider it an ionic compound because specifically because we can look at it and say, well, I know that that has a positive charge. And I know that that has a negative charge. So we're looking at the entire, so we'd still call it an ionic bond or an ionic compound. Um, and the main reason this is here yeah. is to tell you what style of naming to do, oh. right? So we're gonna name it like an ionic compound. So for right here, you're supposed to put ionic, even though it's an ionic compound that has some covalent bonds in it. You are correct about that, but that's not what it's asking. Okay. Is that cleared up? A little bit. Okay. And then oxidine is not a word. <laughs> you, not yet. That's right. Better attitude. And, so with this one, mm -hmm. sulfuric acid, mm -hmm. I'm assuming it's this one. Correct. Okay. And how do you know that? Yes, <laughs> so because it could because be it drops 
this drops mm -hmm. from an eight to an ick. Bingo. But so that's that that is the answer. That is solid. Okay. Because if it's sulfuric, that means that you know that the base molecule, the anion, started with an eight. Mm -hmm. So sulfate. Which sulfate. Okay. Right. So then if you have SO4 mm -hmm. negative two, mm -hmm. would you need a two hydrogen? To cancel out this exactly. negative two charge. Exactly. Because oh, okay. if you only had one hydrogen, then it's not sulfuric it's acid, it's hydrogen different. sulfate. Yeah. So then because so sulfuric acid is H2SO4. Got it. Sweet. Thank you. Good um, no, we only put the eye on the on the last part, so just on the oxide. Good job. Technically, technically, it means it has to be dissolved in water because HCl, HCl can be a gas and it doesn't act as an acid. It acts as a gas molecule. And so you name it like it's a covalent compound. So you just name it hydrogen chloride. But the second it dissolves in water, it becomes an acid. And so HCl is hydrogen is hydrochloric acid, but HCl is a gas is hydrogen chloride. So is it more like the H2 symbol? Yeah, that's if we're splitting here, it's yes. If you said if you called this hydrochloric acid, nobody's gonna look sideways at you because it, this is much more common. But if we're splitting hairs, that's that's the way to determine it. All right, so let's do, get through a few more types of compounds real quick. All right, so if we aren't going to make ions, the ionic compounds are really common because if you have a mixture of two things, one that's trying to gain electrons and one that's trying to lose electrons, 
everybody can be happy, right? So ionic compounds are fairly common anytime you have both metals and non-metals mixed together. Um, and you can, there are actually even ionic compounds that have no non-metals where you have things that are, that are um, positively charged, negatively charged that can form a compound without even having a metal present. Um, but if you don't have enough electrons to go around, if you're missing electrons, then you need to find some way to make all of these different elements, all these different atoms satisfied or stable is a better way. They're not, they don't have emotions. Um, if we're gonna try and make all of these different metal atoms stable by filling their valences, but we don't have enough electrons to go around, then we need to basically, you need to be able to double count electrons. You need to be able to count electrons as being in two valences at the same time. And the way the term we use for that is covalent bonds. We form covalent bonds. Co means in both at the same time. Valent means valences. And I'm a little embarrassed that it took me like almost 10 years of teaching this class before I actually thought about the etymology of the word covalent. It always just, that's well, a covalent bond. What do you mean? Like, well, covalent comes from somewhere. It comes from in both valences at the same time. And that allows you to make everything more stable because the whole point of these atoms becoming more stable is to fill those valences or get them completely empty. Right? And so, and we can actually show this mathematically and and graphically, if you think of, or this y-axis is potential energy. And the x-axis is how far apart two nuclei are. So if you, if you can imagine two hydrogen atoms that each need to gain one electron to be stable, you put them on opposite ends of the universe and slowly start bringing them together. As they get closer and closer together, they're those two electrons start being able to be in both valences at the same time. And you wind up with some optimum distance where you have both electrons are close enough to being around both atoms at the same time, but the nuclei are still far enough apart that they're not pushing each other away. They are pushing each other away, but there's this sort of balancing act where if you get them any closer than this, then the two nuclei are pushing each other away so hard you can't form that bond, right? So all of this is just is just the, the graphical way of showing why covalent bonds form in the first place. But conceptually, it's really easy. If you can share electrons, every atom can act like it has a full valence. Every atom can be more stable that way. And right, so here's another graph. We're gonna do Lewis dot structures. If we don't get to them today, then we're gonna start with them next week. Um, and so the, these dots are representing the valence electrons for fluorine, for instance. So fluorine has four valence electrons. If you put two fluorine atoms next to each other, they each need to gain one electron or they can share. If you put, each of them can bring one electron to the, to the table and those two uh, electrons can become a pair of electrons that are shared between both atoms at the same time. Right? And so that's how you make, or that's why covalent molecules form. Um, and they are also, refer so they're referred to as covalent compounds or molecular compounds generally mean the same thing. Because you make distinct molecules. Ionic compounds don't really make molecules. Ionic compounds stick together in this sort of repeating lattice of alternating positive charges and negative charges. But you basically, you have to have them in that sort of crystal structure. Molecules don't have to be in a crystal structure to be stable. You can have distinct objects where, for instance, every fluorine molecule is its own entity. If you got it cold enough, you could get it to freeze and solidify. But each, even then, every molecule will be a distinct object, as opposed to ionic compounds, where they wind up in this weird crystal structure that 
basically repeats indefinitely in all directions. So if we look at Uh, that's a decent figure. If you can picture every every green atom in this structure is a chloride, and every silvery one is a sodium ion. And they have to alternate in really distinct, well well established patterns. Otherwise, you wind up with two positives next to each other, and two positives next to each other are going to repel each other. So every ionic compound is solid does this. On the flip side, if you have, we look at crystal structure of water, if we get water and we freeze it, um, we get something that looks more like this, where you can still see every one of these, there's just still a bunch of distinct water molecules. The water molecules, you can still, I'll tell the water molecules apart from each other, right? So there's still distinct objects, even when you put them into this low energy crystal state. So they behave differently. So we, that's why we refer to them as covalent compounds or molecular compounds. We still use the phrase molecular weight for ionic compounds, even though they don't form molecules just because it's a convenient way to describe talking about the entire compound um but that we're gonna in general we're going to classify them as either being ionic if you can look at it and say that's a positive charge and a negative charge or it's covalent if it's a bunch of non-metals sharing electrons so in general the, the easiest way to remember how this is going to work um and i'm I'm going to say this again when we do those dot structures is the number of empty spots in the valence is going to be the number of bonds that compound can form usually. So for instance, phosphorus, phosphorus has five valence electrons, right? So if we're using the same format. You could say, you could draw it like that. You could say that Okay, well, it's got three vacant, if it's got five electrons in the valence shell, it's got three empty spots, so it can make three bonds. The problem with that is that phosphorus has a d orbital involved. It doesn't have any electrons in the d orbital, but it's got an empty d orbital. It's not limited to following the octet rule. And so as a result, there's more than one stable way that you can have phosphorus make a covalent compound. So for instance, you can have PCL3 or PCL5 are both stable compounds. So basically this throws out the window, the idea from ionic compounds that all you need to know is know what you have and that'll tell you how many you need, right? That's not true with covalent compounds because there's more than one stable compound you could make from the same pieces. So we need a way to specify which one we're talking about. So the, the logic behind it is a little convoluted, but naming covalent compounds is really easy because you just straight up say how many of each atom you have. Phosphorus trichloride and phosphorus pentachloride. You're just going to use Greek prefixes which are the, the roots that we use for here. Don't need to gain electrons if you share electrons, covalent thinking. Um, basically, we use the same prefixes that we use for a lot of, of English words um, and Spanish words. Mono, di, tri, tetra is a weird one. I've never heard tetra, you usually think of quad. Um, as the prefix, but tetra in Greek means four. Uh, and the way that I always help people remember that is um, everybody's played Tetris, right? You ever realize that every piece in Tetris is made out of four blocks? No, not, not one of the ones that come from the top. 
every piece that comes from the top in Tetris is made out of four blocks put together in different ways. That's why it's called Tetris, because the Greek base tetra means four. So hopefully that will be helpful. At the very least, if you remember, it's the odd man out from the rest of these. Mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, deca. It's also the same as, as your um, uh, polygon shapes, with the exception of tetra. Except you can't really have a, a monogon or a digon. Um, other than that, they're pretty easy to remember once you get used to them. And naming with these, you just say the name of, or say the, the prefix and say the name of each atom. In general, whatever's further up into the right on the periodic table, we put at the end of the formula, whatever's closest to fluorine is the worst at sharing electrons. And so we basically say, okay, we're gonna name it like it's got a negative charge when it comes to adding I to the end of it. But other than that, we just say how many we have. So H2O, the true, the inorganic way of naming that would be dihydrogen monoxide. You get a little sloppy with the, the prefixes that end in a vowel if our, if our element starts with a vowel. You don't write monoxide. Just usually just write monoxide, um, but I'm not going to be picky about that. But the one on the right, what would that be? So I meant the one on the far right. Dinitrogen trioxide. The one in the middle is a little bit weird because we don't say monocarbon monoxide. In general, we assume whatever the first element is, we only have one of it, unless we specify otherwise. So the example we did a few minutes ago, phosphorus trichloride and phosphorus pentachloride, we don't specify monophosphorus trichloride, it's usually redundant. So we just say phosphorus trichloride and you only use these prefixes on the first element if you have more than one. That said, it'd be a pretty minor deduction if you did say monocarbon monoxide, you're still showing me more or less, and that's still a name that nobody could ever possibly misinterpret, right? The whole idea is to be unambiguous with our names so that anybody who's reading what you write or listening to you speak could get the right formula from it, right? So you're being overly specific, you're being redundant by saying monocarbon monoxide, but at the same time, it's not, you're not technically wrong. It's just a weird way of saying it. So naming these is really easy. Drawing the structures for them, as we'll find out, is a little trickier. But naming covalent compounds is really straightforward. Just use those prefixes. So how do we tell the difference between these? How do we classify the different compounds? How do we know if it's ionic or covalent? Covalent is always going to be a combination of just non-metals for this class. This is, this is why chemistry gets a bad reputation of like everything you learn in this class that you're later going to be told, well, mostly, but technically it's not quite right. Um, mostly ionic compounds are going to be a metal and a non-metal. And covalent compounds are going to be two non-metals or sometimes more than two non-metals. The more correct ways, if you can recognize that you have a positive ion and a negative ion, then it's an ionic compound. The trick is that you can actually have covalent bonds in an ionic compound. Right? There are some groups of atoms that are most stable when they form covalent bonds and then have a few extra electrons as well. 
So those are what we refer to as polyatomic ions. And those, these are the ones that are on that list that I handed out. And they still make ionic compounds just like any other ion. And so you, to name something that has a polyatomic ion, it's still the same rules for ionic nomenclature. You just say the name of the positive ion, say the name of the negative ion. This just means we have a bunch of other options for what the negative ion could be. And so recognizing these and knowing the charge that goes with them winds up being important. This is why I just have to say point blank, you have to memorize it for the quiz that will be next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, quiz, this stuff, formulas. So it'll, be, it'll work the same way. The formulas, including the charge, match up with the name. I said, not matching. I'm going to give you, I'm basically I'm going to go through and I'm going to delete half of um, the names and delete half of the formulas. So that every, this table is going to be half empty. You just have to fill it in. So if I erase this, you'd have to be able to look at that and say hydrogen carbonate. From the formula, including the charge, to the name, or from the name to the formula, including the charge. Cody? Well, yeah, I use you can use a periodic table. Um, so that, that can be helpful. There are actually a few places where knowing that, or having a periodic table can be helpful. Um, there's a few tricks to memorizing this too. There's similarities in the way that they use these suffixes. For instance, if you look at nitrate versus nitrite, if you know what the formula is for nitrate or for any of the ones that end in eight, the it version of it is gonna be the same formula, same charge, missing one oxygen. Nitrate is NO3 with a negative charge. Nitrite is NO2 with a negative charge. Sulfate is SO4 with a negative two charge. Sulfite is SO3 with a negative two charge. And so there's a, a few similarities there. There's a lot that end in either it or eight. So if you memorize all the eights and you know that rule, you also have all the eights memorized. The eights are named because those are the most common ones. The most common form of these ions are usually called eights. And so if you know that, if you have those down, figuring out the formula for ite is, is not too tricky. So chlorate and chlorite, sulfate and sulfite, phosphate and phosphite. So they use these sort of, these, this basic structure where you say, okay, well, the most common form ends in eight, if it has an extra oxygen, then you add per in front of it, which comes from the same root as, as uh, hyper. If you're hyper, you have extra energy, right? Hyperactivity is where that comes from, but also like hyperglycemic. Hyper means more than. So per sulfate has one extra oxygen compared to sulfate. Sulfite is missing an oxygen. Hypo means even one less than that. It's like hypoglycemic means you're, you have low blood sugar. Hyperglycemic means you have extra blood sugar. So hypo means you're missing an oxygen. So you subtract two oxygens from the eight. And then the other way that these get tweaked a little bit is by adding an H plus ion to something. Basically you can add an H plus ion to any of those polyatomics and it changes the charge by one because you, you just added something with a plus one charge to it. So hydrogen sulfate is sulfate, but with an H plus stuck on the front. Hydrogen carbonate is carbonate, but with an H plus stuck on the front. And before anybody, asks, carbonite doesn't exist, unfortunately. I don't know if fortunate or unfortunate. Star Wars isn't real, I'm sorry to say. Um, carbonite doesn't exist. There's not a stable form of carbon and oxygen 
um, that would follow these rules. So even though it seems like carbonite should be a thing based on these rules and the fact that carbonate exists, um, it doesn't. So if we're naming these in an ionic compound, we just use the name just like before. We just need to know these ions in order to get the right formula, including the charge. Right, so copper with a plus one charge, sulfate with a negative two charge, make a compound where you need two copper ions, two copper one ions for every one sulfate, just like we did before, right? It just looks more complicated. Cu2SO4, but this whole chunk is sulfate, including the negative two charge. This whole chunk is two copper plus ones. So our rules for, for the formula still hold up the exact same way. Don't do what I did there. You don't need, don't write the charge once it's an ionic compound, because if it's an ionic compound, those charges are supposed to cancel out. You can write the charge on it for the purpose of reminding yourself what sulfate's charge is, but you it's a bad habit to get in when it comes to like your, your final answer for one of these. So we, there's lots of ways you can practice with this. And since lab is all about practicing with these, we're gonna skip some of this for now. Um, and because all it really is, is you looking at that table and practicing using it anyway, right? So if you have that table and you have your periodic table, you have everything you need, to do these ionic nomenclature questions. All right, and the last thing we're gonna add to ionic nomenclature is specifically that there are some ionic compounds that when, they're, when they form a solid, they're actually most stable. They basically, if you just make the ionic compound um, and you turn it into a crystal structure, it has lots of empty space in it sometimes. An empty space is not very stable. And so there's a lot of compounds that are actually get more stable when you basically fill that empty space with some water. Water molecules dissolve into the solid, which sounds backwards because we're used to solids dissolving in water. But there are some compounds called hydrates that have water sort of embedded in their crystal structure. The good news is that there's no predictable way to know what's going to form a hydrate and what doesn't, and how many waters you need to put in there. So it's something that you basically just need to explicitly say how many waters there are. It's not something that you can predict just by looking at the periodic table or anything. So with that in mind, naming hydrates is just as easy as using those Greek prefixes again. You name it, it's always going to be an ionic compound. So you name the ionic compound, and then you just say something hydrate. So magnesium, so magnesium sulfate forms a hydrate, and the formula is written with this dot symbol. And then you just write how many waters you have. The reason that it gets important to include that, they don't affect the chemistry that much, but they do affect the molecular weight. So we need to know that they're in there for the formula. Um, and when we name this, we just name this first part first and then say heptahydrate. Hepta means seven, hydrate means you add some waters in there, right? So if you know how to use those prefixes, this part is really easy. You just need to have seen it once and remember what it is. Um, if we go the other way, Um, so magnesium sulfate heptahydrate you can buy at the grocery store. Uh, that's Epsom salts. Let's see. Um, let's see copper CuCl two four H two O. What would the name be for that compound? 
So it's going to be copper something fluoride if it's CuCl2, which puts the charge have to be on the copper. Plus two on the copper. Add and we'll cancel out negative two from the fluorides. So it's copper two fluoride is the name of the ionic part here. And then we just say how many waters there are. Tetrahydrate. So it's, it's one more thing you have to have seen before. But if you get the hang of doing this, this is easy. Once you get the hang of it, this is really straightforward. This is the trickiest part is knowing those polyatomic ions and uh, knowing how to use those Roman numerals for those transition metals, right? And basically, there's no better way than just practicing. So we're going to brute force memorize it. And this is the this is the easy version because your pages your uh, handout's only three pages long, right? Um, you take Gen Chem, will really hammer it into your brain, and it'll be a there, I used to have one there where the packet, including the pre-lab, was 17 pages long. And it was like eight pages front and back of practice. I don't do that one quite as bad anymore, but that's all we're doing. And come to lab if you want to work on it around me so you can ask me questions. If you have any questions about any of this stuff, if you get it, you know what you're doing. I'm not going to take role in lab. You don't have to be in lab to finish this one. And so... Uh, and it's not due until next Wednesday. And you can turn it online whenever you're ready. Um, I have questions about the extra charge. Yeah, so I was just noticing because it seemed, I felt like there was too much, it shouldn't have been too much time pressure, but you had issues finishing the bottom part, right? Yeah, I'm have you Have you talked to anybody at the, for accommodations on campus? Yeah, I have a few for For extra time? Yeah. Okay, if you have, if you talk to the, to Kelly in the, in the um, accommodation center, um, then have her send me your, your accommodations because you can get extra time in this class. Yeah. If, if you have, already have that document. Okay. All right. Have a good one, Jacob. Your choice. If you want to keep that to study from, then do it online. Otherwise, um, I'll take it down there right now. Okay. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. Um, there might be a few extras floating around. Otherwise, I'll print some out when we get it down to, to lab. Okay. Have a good day. Hey, see you, Anigo. I noticed this morning a couple of people were saying it's like mm -hmm. this one. Yes. So oh, I... so if you if you resubmit it, yes. then then um you're good to go. Then I'll I'll only look at the most recent one. So if you fix it, just resubmit. No, but I I sent you. The one. I mean because I just um, noticed those mistakes mm -hmm. after that. So can I resend? So, or put it with the assignment, just submit it to the assignment. Okay. Because I changed the setting, so you should be able to do that now. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, have a good one. Thanks, you too.